face and said, Dad, my father, your pastor, just happened to catch me on a week that I didn't have anything scheduled. Right. And, uh, right. and so here I am this, this, uh, this morning with you uh, to uh, be able to share the Word of God with you this morning. And, uh, and I guess he's taking a little break and down and I think he told me he was going to Mississippi down to a state park down there to, yeah. to visit the camp and visit and have some, some relaxation. So I'm glad to be able to help him out during that. We're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna preach to you from the book of Psalms this morning. And we're actually gonna look at Psalm uh, eighteen. Oh my gosh. Psalm eighteen. This wow. morning. <laughs> this is God. <laughs> Honey, <laughs> your mom just sent me that this morning to read. Oh, this is you? God. Well, all right. Well, that's <laughs> you God. Psalm 18. We're going to actually start in verse 22. This is a long psalm. So we're not going to read all of the verses, but we're going to start in verse 22 because I think that's where God wants us to start this morning. So if you look in Psalm chapter 18, verse 22, we'll start there together. All right? And the, word, and the Bible says this, For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me, which means repaid me, according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. With, and with the devious, you will show yourself to be shrewd. For you will save the humble people, but will bring down the haughty looks. For you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. But my God, I, by my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except our Lord. And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength, it says verse 32, and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer and sets me on high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under me so that my feet will not slip. I have pursued my enemies and I have overtaken them. Neither did I turn back against them until they were destroyed. I have wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen and they are under my feet. Amen. Now I'm focusing on that part of the psalm this morning because there's two things I want to talk to you about today. Just two things. The first thing is that we have to be dedicated to the Word of God. Dedicated to the Word of God. You see, the world will tell us that we should dedicate ourselves to all kinds of different things. Yes. That all kinds of different things are important. Amen. They place importance on making money. The world places importance on being happy. The world places importance on, on having possessions and owning things. But the Bible doesn't talk about any of those things. No. The Bible doesn't talk about any of those things as being happy or blessed. 
you know, there used to, years, years ago, there used to be, well, there still is today in some circles, a, what, something they called a prosperity gospel. Has anybody ever heard of that term before? The, a prosperity gospel that some people are preaching says that if you just love God, he will give you all the money you'll ever desire. He will prosper you. You'll have good living. You'll, you'll never have to worry about your bills anymore. You won't ever be without health problems anymore. Well, that's not what God said. No, it's not true. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we are blessed by God spiritually. Prosperity comes to us spiritually. The Word of God, dedication to the Word of God, it is an understanding that we're not going to just, God's just not going to help us win the lottery. That's not what prosperity is about. God is not going to give us a million dollars. Although, man, that would be really nice. But God's not, not going to do that. No. He isn't going to give us a million dollars. Because you know what happens when people win the lottery? They lose everything they've ever had. Even what they had before they started. Because they don't know what to do with all that money. And they end up doing what the, the, the uh, <laughs> they just end up wasting it on, on crazy things. And, and things that are irresponsible. See, God's not going to give us things just to prosper us in that way. God wants to prosper us in our life. In our heart. In our mind. See, the, the main goal of our life is to be close to Jesus Christ. The main goal of our life is to have a relationship with Him that's meaningful. Now, I'm married and I have sons and I have three young men and I, I want relationships with them. But when my relationship with God isn't solid, guess where my relationships fail? With my wife and with my children. Because my primary, my primary duty is to be close to God. See, Jesus said, seek Him while He still may be found. Yeah. Because there's going to come a day in our future on this earth when men will seek God and will not be able to find Him. And that's a scary place to be. But we need to seek Him now when we can find Him. You see, the verses we have here is that for His judgments were before me and He did not put away His statutes from me. You see, we have to hide the Word of God in our hearts. We have to have his judgments and his rules. Statutes are rules and the laws of God. There's laws in this book. Laws of life that we're supposed to follow. Those laws of life are do not lie. Do not bear false witness. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We, we call them, oh, those are just the Ten Commandments. No, those are the laws of God. Those are the laws of life. Amen. They're not just the Ten Commandments. You see, when Jesus came, he said, a new command that I give you. And it starts with this. He said, the first and greatest two commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, and it is to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he gave him another command. He says, but a new command I give you. It is said that you should hate your enemies, but I tell you that you should love your enemies. And pray for them that persecute you. And he said, and then he said, and another command I give you to love one another. The four basic laws of Jesus are about love. That's what he means. He said all of the commandments hang on those four. If we can love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, love our neighbor as ourselves, and if we can, if we can love our enemies and love one another, then we won't have to worry about lying, stealing, bearing false witness, coveting. All those things won't, we won't want to do because we love one another, because we love our neighbor. But you see, those statutes were before David. See, this is when David is writing this psalm, he's saying, God, your judgments are before me. I can see how you've judged the people of Israel. I can see how you have how you have created laws for us to follow. And they are before me. I keep them in front of me at all times so that I know them. If we're going to know God and know His laws, we have to know His Word. This has to be 
more important than just an occasional glance. We have to study the Word of God. This is important. If we're going to make it in this life, in this day that we live in, in this hour that we live in, we have to know this. That's what David is saying in Psalm 18, right here in verse 22 and 23. He's saying, I know these things because I've kept the Word of God before me. You see, the day that we're living in, the, the world is, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that the day we're going to live in is going to continue to get worse. Paul told Timothy it's going to get worse. He told the pastor, Timothy, that this is going to continue to get worse. Things are going to continue to go downhill in this world. But guess what? We don't have to be afraid of that. Because we have a hope. Our hope isn't in the things of this world that are going to fall apart. Our hope is in the God who created this world that says... It doesn't matter when the world falls apart. I'm in control and I've got you in my hands. And I'm going to lead you the way that I want to, you to go. But the first thing is, is we have to keep the law of God before our hearts and our minds. We've got to read it. We've got to understand it. We have to memorize it. I was leading a Bible study not too long ago. And I did, a, I did a schedule of things we were going to study, and I put down a memory verse. Now, these were adult men. Men? Let's do this men's Bible study. Yeah. I said, guys, you need to memorize this word. And they, a couple of guys were like, why do we have to memorize these words? I mean, we're, we're, we're older men. We can just find it in the Bible. And I'm like, the Bible, the Bible tells us to hide the word of God in our heart. Yeah. And hiding it means that we remember it. We we, 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 we are able to recognize it or recall it from our yes. from what we've studied because God also tells us to have a ready defense for our faith. See, our job is to tell other people about who? Jesus. Jesus. We have to be ready to do that. We can't be ready to do that if we don't know what the Word of God says. If we're not able to give the Word of God to someone else, now listen, David said in Psalm 23, or Psalm 18, verse 23, I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from iniquity. You see, we have to give our life a glance every now and then and say, am I doing anything wrong? Is there sin in my own life? Now listen, I'm standing up here and I'm delivering this to you and I have to tell you, I have to do that. I have to say, God, am I, if I've done something wrong, and there are on occasions where there are times where my wife will tell me I've done something wrong. <laughs> and you've messed up. <clears throat> and honestly, there are times where I tell her, look, you've messed up. But you see, here's the thing. We have to be honest about the fact that, hey, I've sinned. I've made a mistake. I've not yes. done something right. God, you're going to have to forgive me. See, did David make mistakes? Oh, oh yes. yes. Yeah. David made mistakes with his son Absalom. David made mistakes when he had an affair with Bathsheba. David made mistakes when he sent Uriah to the front line so that he could be killed. David made mistake after mistake after mistake. But here he's saying, I was blameless before you. You know why David can say he's blameless before him, even though he made mistakes? Because he came to God and said, forgive me for my sin. I repent. I'm sorry. I messed up. I made a mistake. There are times where I feel like I'm, making, I'm, I'm asking God to forgive me ten times a day. And then there are times where I feel like I'm doing really good. And, and, and I don't have to ask God to forgive me a lot because I'm really working hard at doing the right thing. <coughs> but I still have to keep in mind all the time, God, keep iniquity from me. Keep my life from sin. Help me to control my, myself, my anger, my temper, my tongue, my life, my walk. Help me to be who you want me to be. Keep me from sin. 
Now David said in the next verse, verse 23, because he followed the law of God, because he kept himself blameless, he said, the Lord repaid me. You see, here's the blessing. Here's the blessing that God promises. He repaid me according to what? My righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands in His sight. You see, God's not going to repay us and bless us if we don't aren't sinless in His sight. If we don't ask God to forgive us of our sin, He can't bless us. He can't bless us because there's sin in our life. And where there's sin, He can't dwell. He desires to dwell in our heart and our life. And, been, and, and He desires to be in our thoughts, but He can't be there if we have sin on our hands. Because it's just like having blood on our hands. It's just like having blood on our hands where we have sinned and God looks and says, I can't bless sin. God can't bless sin. We've got to keep those things from our life. But because David repented and kept his life from sin, God blessed him. Now see, here's what we have to do as men and women of God. Verse 25 says, You will be merciful and show yourself to be merciful. So you've got to be able to look at people who are struggling and having a hard time and not be rude or mean to them. <laughs> but you have to have, you have to show them a little mercy and a little grace. Mercy means that we give them love even when they don't deserve it. We need to care for people when they we think in our mind, Psh, whatever. Yes. <laughs> I don't want to love that person. We got to. But we have to. We have to be merciful. Because in Ephesians 4.32, God said, forgive them just like I forgave you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. And if God could lay out his life on an altar for me, on a cross for me. Then when someone is struggling and hurting, I have to love them. I have to care for them. I have to reach out my hand and lift them up. I can't turn them away. And it doesn't matter what they're going through or what they've been through. I was talking with some men the other day about why it's so hard to minister to people with the gospel today. And the biggest thing that it's hard to do is not because they have some great sin in their life. Because there are a lot of people today that, that like uh, some people that I work with, that don't have these great big sins in their life. In fact, they'll tell me, I've never done anything bad. I've never robbed anybody, I've never stolen, I've never, I've never, I don't lie against people, I don't cheat on my wife, I don't drink, I don't curse, I don't do any of those things. I'm a good person. Anybody else ever heard that before? Yes. And so they think that because they're good people that they get to make it into heaven. And so it's hard for them to understand that God says that their life is still full of sin regardless of whether they think they've been good or not. And so it's really hard to, to look at people sometimes and say, but you, you have a life that's full of sin. Because the Bible tells us that there are none good. Not one. There are none good. No, not one. That means us. And that means those people that think they're good and have all these good things in their life, they're not good. And if we want them to to come to know the Savior that is good. <laughs> He's a good Father. He's a good Savior. He's a good friend. Then they have to understand that their life is full of sin. And so we have to show them mercy when they don't think that they need it. We have to show them kindness when they don't think that they need it. 
With a blameless man, it says here, you show yourself blameless. That means that among your brothers, you live your life all the time blameless and sin free. That means you don't walk out the door and live a different life than what you live when you're in here. You can't do that. Because doing that is going to cause you all kinds of problems. You can see what the world says about people like that is, you guys are all hypocrites if you do that. You say one thing and then you live another way. We have to live blameless before our brothers and our sisters. We have to be blameless and sin free here and out there. We have to say, I'm not going to let sin or anything in my life that's going to corrupt me, corrupt my witness, corrupt my life. I want that stuff to be out of my life. We've got to be pure. Pure. God says to be holy as I am holy. And he also says, be, be perfect. How many of you think you're perfect? Anybody? Oh, I better put my hand down because I don't think I'm perfect either. <laughs> I'm not perfect. And there are some times where I'm probably not that holy. And there are some times where I, last night I was with some friends and I said something and he got upset. A friend got upset with me. I'm like, and that was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. And I wasn't meaning it to be mean or hurtful, but it came out that way. And so sometimes we say things or do things that aren't holy, that aren't right, that hurt people. We have to be we have to repent. We have to come back and we have to just, we have to make a decision that I want my life to be pure. I want my life to be holy. I want my life to be perfect before Jesus. That's why Paul said that we strive every day. That means we have to work at perfecting our life before God. Knowing that he's the only one that can make us perfect. He's the only one that can make us into what he wants us to be. We can't do anything on our own to make ourselves perfect. We can't clean ourselves up. We can't wash out our soul. We can't change our minds. God, the only one that can do that is God. But here David is saying in verse 25, 26, and 27, he's saying, With the merciful you must show yourself merciful. With the blameless you must be blameless. With the pure you must show yourself to be pure. Now here's, a, here's one. With the devious you will show yourself to be shrewd. Now when you think about this verse, you think, well, that kind of popped out of nowhere. Where did he put that in there? There are people in this world that are manipulative and hurtful people. They're devious and they're hurtful. And they are not going to change. Their hearts are rebellious. Their minds are rebellious. And they're not going to change. But we still have a job to tell those people about Jesus. And so even though they're devious and they're hurtful, we have to be very shrewd. Shrewd just means really smart about how we share the people, the gospel with those people. How we deal with those people in love. Because sometimes those people will bite right at you. They'll hurt you even though you're trying to love them. Even though you're trying to help them. Even though you're trying to wrap your arms around them. They'll bite you. Because they're devious. And they're manipulative. And they're hurtful. But Jesus said to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And he also told us to be shrewd as serpents. You see, God is saying, you know, there, he knows that there are people that are going to be hard for us to talk to. And he knows that there's going to be people that are, even though that they may come and say they're a part of, and they want to be a part of the family of God, but they're devious. <laughs> They're manipulative. They're hurtful by their actions and their attitudes. But we still have to love them. You see, that's what makes the job of your pastor really, really hard. Because there are times in my father's ministry 
And he would never share these things with me. He probably might not like that I'm sharing some of this with me. But there have been times in my life, in his life, where the people that he loved hurt him as a pastor. And he still had to find a way to love. He still had to find a way to say, you're not, I'm not going to kick you out of the house of God. I'm not going to, I'm going to love you and I'm going to care for you and I'm going to be there for you. And that, that is part of our life. See, when David is telling us in this psalm, he's, he's speaking from experience. David had his own men turn against him. When his son Absalom wanted power, he started pulling people away from David's choice men. Choice, he started to pull people away. And David still had to be the king of Israel no matter what. He was still the king. He still had to do his job. He still had to be the king of Israel, even though his own son turned against him. Now, God only saves humble people. Verse 27 says, For you will save the humble people, but you will bring down the humble. See, the humble are people where he that come and they say, Jesus, I want to give you my life. I want to give you me. God, I, I'm going to humble myself before you and say, you know what, I don't want to be in control anymore because I realize that I can't be in control because I've made a mess of my life. Or I just haven't given my life to you and I need to give you my life. I need to humble myself for you. There's a saying that says it's better to be humble than to be humbled. And God has given you the opportunity to humble yourself and recognize who He is. But there's coming a day when He's going to pass judgment and He will humble you. He will humble you. Because the Bible says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that He is Lord. So you can either humble yourself now when you have the opportunity to come to Him of your own accord. Or on judgment day, He will say, bow, and you will bow. And He will judge you from that position. You see, that's where David is. David's telling us and helping us to understand where we should be and how we should be. Now here's the good part. Here's, here's where David then says, said, if we get to this place, he said in verse 28, you will be a lamp into my feet and you will enlighten the darkness around me. God wants to show you what's going on in the world around you. He wants you to know and understand. He wants you to understand and know Him. He doesn't want you to feel like you don't know who He is. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to have an intimate relationship with Him. He wants to have a time with you where He calls you by name and you call Him by name and you talk to one another as friends. God wants from us. You see, God called us to be His children. He wants to adopt us into His family. And there are times in family where God calls us down on the carpet. You know, like I got to call my sons on the carpet every now and then. They say I do it all the time. But then there are times where we're able to just have a conversation and just talk about whatever's going on. Because that's the same kind of relationship God wants to have with us. There are times where God corrects our path, but then there are times where when we're just spending time alone with God, He comes and He wraps His arm around us when we're hurting, or He just talks to us as a friend, or He shows us that He loves and He cares about us. Amen. But you see, that's because he's opened the darkness and he shed light on the darkness 
And we don't, when we look at that, we look at our relationship with him and we say, well, I don't want that darkness in my life. Because God has shone the light on those dark places in our lives. And we start to come closer to him so we can go further away from those things. Yes. And we can push those things away. Amen. Now here's what happens. He shows the light on the darkness and then he empowers us. He gives us power to live in this life. Here's how we know that. Verse 29 says, For I can run against a troop. What he's talking about here is running through the enemy lines. Not just running up to them and standing in front of them. Running through the enemy lines. You see, when they used to battle in David's time, they would line up on opposite sides of a field and they would run at each other with everything that they had. And if you broke the enemy line, then you had the advantage. If you broke through the enemy ranks, you, were, you, you had broken the enemy down. You could defeat them because you had broken through the enemy lines. And what David knew is that David said, you are, you are a light in my darkness. You're going you're gonna to enlighten my path. And you're going to give me the power to run through the enemy, to, to conquer the enemy. There's only one enemy that we really face. There's only one. You guys are not the enemy. Each other is not the enemy. Satan is our enemy. He's yes. the enemy of our souls. He's yes. the liar. He's the great deceiver. He's, he's, he, it's him and him alone. And God is, and, and listen, he walks around, the Bible says he walks around like a roaring lion. Are we still supposed to love Satan? No. I know. Well, I said love everybody. <laughs> no, I don't love Satan. No, no. Here's the thing. God said, God says, or the Bible tells us that Satan roams around like a roaring lion. Here's the thing about, I heard, I heard another pastor say one time that when he walks around like a roaring lion, that means he's not really a roaring lion. He's trying to imitate a roaring lion. But he says, He's really just a toothless rough. That's really all that he is. And a, rug, a toothless rug of a lion is a rug that you put under your feet. The thing of it is, is that, see, the enemy has no power over us. We have the power to run through the enemy, to conquer him, to be over him. God has given us authority over the enemy. He says, Jesus told us, he says, all power and authority has been given me. In under heaven, and I give it to you. Yes. He gave us the power to overcome the enemy. He gave us the power to run through the truth. He said, when I read this next person, he said, my, my God, I can leap over a wall. When I read this verse, verse 29, he wants me to run it through a troop and run over a wall. I started to think about Superman. <laughs> He's faster than a locomotive. Yes. He's faster than a speeding bullet. He can leap tall buildings in a single bound. Right? right? But now I want you to think of this in terms of being a Christian. What he's saying is, I've given you the power to run through the enemy, to jump over his walls, to jump over his weaponry, to conquer him completely and wholly. You have the power to overcome the enemy completely. Amen. Amen. I've given you that power. Now, David is now recognizing this next verse. He, rec he wants to, us to understand who God is. He's told us what we have to be and what God's going to give us. But in this next verse, he says, as for God, his way is perfect. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is perfect. Proven, and he is a shield to all who trust in him. You see, God's way is perfect. He's made a way for us. See, the Bible tells us that there's a way that seems right to us, a way that we think that seems right, but in the end, it leads to destruction. Our way leads to destruction. Yeah. But Jesus said, 
But David said of God, his way is perfect. It's perfect. And what that means is that what that means is that we don't have to worry what's going on in the world around us. If we're following God with our life, if we're following him with our whole heart, we don't need to be, we don't need to worry, we don't need to fear. His way is perfect. And we know that we don't have to worry or fear because it says the word of the Lord is proven. It has proved itself over and over and over and over and over again. No matter how many people try to say that the word of God is disproven or there are parts of the Bible that are wrong, no matter how many times they say that, they get proven wrong over and over and over and over again because God's word has been proven and he is a shield to us. Now there's a difference between a shield and a buckler. Anybody know what the difference is? A shield is a shield that covers you from head to about your mid-thigh. And you put it out to protect yourself from darts and from, and, from, and from arrows and from spears. But a buckler is a little small shield, probably no bigger than this. And they put it on their wrist. And a buckler is an offensive weapon. It's kind of like giving somebody a headbutt with your forearm. Oh. Whack! Well, that would be one. Yeah? I'm just going to whack you. So they would carry a buckler in one hand and a sword in another. And they're whacking you with the buckler and they're slicing at you with the sword. They're two offensive weapons in their hand. And see, Jesus even told us, I will be your shield and your buckler. I will be your sword. I will be those things for you. See, God, it's kind of like we're walking through this world and Jesus is doing all the fighting up there. But when we try to say, well, let me in there, let me fight, guess what happens? We fail. We fail. We fail so miserably, we fall on our face. Because we think we know what we're doing. And God's like, just let me do this for you. I've already defeated the enemy. You don't have to fight this battle. Why are you trying to fight this battle? Amen. I've already, I've already beaten him. He's already under your feet. And 31, this is the one, this is verse 31 that I read to you earlier. For who is, the, who is God except our Lord? And who is a rock except our God? Who is it? There's no one else. There is no one else. You see, when we make other things more important and we put more, we put people or other things as more important than God, then it tears God away from us. We begin to break down and we begin to have troubles. But when we can say there is no one who is God except the Lord, there is no one who is going to be my rock except God, there is no one who I'm going to depend on more than him. I am going to depend on him with everything that I have. It doesn't matter what goes wrong in your life. It doesn't matter what comes against you. It doesn't matter who says anything about you. It doesn't matter what goes wrong in your finances. It doesn't matter what goes wrong in your family. It doesn't matter because he is our God. And he is our rock. And His way is perfect. And His way is just. If we depend on Him, we don't have to worry about anything else. We don't have to worry about anything else. You see, God's arm is our strength. He told us, the psalmist David writes in another song, that the right arm of the Lord is our defense. The right arm of the Lord. It's kind of like thinking about, you know, I, I'm strong in my right arm, but I'm kind of been a little, little bit weaker in my left, right? You always, especially with men who've ever lifted weights, they know, well, there's always one arm that I'm just a little bit less strong in. And you get this picture when he says the right arm of the Lord, that you're getting the strongest arm of the Lord. 
the strongest arm of the Lord to be your strength. And here's what happens. The strongest uses his strength to make your way perfect. That's what it tells us in verse 31. His strength makes our way perfect. We don't have to. We don't have to even strive to be perfect. When we follow him and have a relationship with him, his strength will make us perfect. He will make our feet run like a deer. That means he'll give us the ability that even when we feel like physically weak, when we feel tired, like I feel tired today. I, my son went, had got a puppy, and we have been trying. He's been, we, he's been training the puppy, and I've been working with him. But we have to put him outside because it's going to be, he's going to be a hunting dog. So we have to kennel him. We have to train him. We have to kennel the dog because of, he's going to be a hunting dog. And so yesterday I got, went and got a kennel. And we're pulling it off and we're tearing it apart. So today I'm feeling kind of sore. <laughs> and I'm feeling kind of like, I'm too old to do stuff like this. I'm a little tired. And, but, but God, and we, when we look at life, when, when we say, well, I'm too tired, I'm too worn out, I'm too spiritually deprived, I'm feeling weak, I don't feel like I have any energy, God says, I will give you strength, and I'll give you the ability to run like a deer. Anybody ever seen a deer run? When they get going full speed, boy, they're running crazy. I mean, they're fast, and it's hard to shoot them. It's hard to get them. It's like, it's like you know, you are shooting at a moving target. Now, I seem to have to be good at moving targets because they run into my car all the time. But, I, but the thing it is, is that when we talk about, we talk about giving us feet like it being to say, I'm going to make you quick. I'm going to make you fast. And I'm going to make you strong. Now, here's the other thing. He teaches us how to use our hands to make war. Now, you think, well, we just talked about that God should fight our battle for us. But listen, we are going to come under attack by the enemy. And we have to defend ourselves and push the enemy back. Because the, the Bible says that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of the air. We fight against them and we war against them because they attack us. Now Jesus is our defense. When we call, if we, it's it's kind of like, um, underdog, right? Yeah. We're we're in this fight, and we're like, I can't, Jesus, I can't take it anymore. He, you hear, here I come to save the day. And here he comes. Here he comes out of the middle of nowhere. Underdog. Underdog. Yeah. But Jesus is no underdog, right? But here he comes in the middle of our fight. And he just says, I'm going to take care of it. I'm here to save the day. Yes. Even when we fight. You see, he teaches us to make war, to protect ourselves, to push back the enemy. Now listen, we're not pushing back the enemy just from ourselves. Because when we tell people about Jesus and we present them with the gospel of Jesus Christ to the point of salvation, we are making war yes. against the enemy. Because the enemy doesn't want those people to hear about Jesus. No. And I can tell you from my personal experience, every time I talk to people about Jesus, man, it feels like people are always coming against me or something's always, or I have a bad week or I have a bad day. And it's not because I've done anything wrong. It's because the enemy's like, you, you, you've messed my world up and I don't like that. And so I'm going to come against you. And those are times when I have to fall on my knees and say, God, I need your help to get me through this day. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. And I know why I'm having a hard time. Because the enemy is coming against me. But God, give me the ability. Give me the ability to make war against my enemy. Now listen to this part. Verse 34. He teaches. He re, he. he teaches my hands to make war so that my arm can bend a bow of bronze. Now I want you to think, what are bows made of? Wood and stone. Or fiberglass. Now, have you ever tried to bend a bow of bronze? Now I want you to think of this. How many of you guys have ever bent metal? I don't want to tough. I'm going to bend some metal. Right? Can you do it with your bare hands? 
you usually have to have some tools, right? <laughs> you usually have to have a vice grip, maybe, um, you know, maybe a couple of vice grips or maybe a vice grips and, and, and some, kind of, some kind of wrench so you can torque that thing so it's going to bend the way you want it to go, right? Now, if you just pick up a bow that's made of bronze and you put a string on that sucker and you say, I'm going to pull that back, what's going to happen? Oh, that's what's going to happen. You can pull that back because you're trying to bend metal. Now, again, this, it gives me the idea of Superman in my mind. God gives us the ability to just grab that thing and whoosh, war. He gives us the strength to make war. And the enemy's throwing darts at us and he says, well, you're going to throw arrows back. And you're going to throw them from a bow of bronze. He's saying, look, I'm going to give you the tools to fight against your enemy. I'm going to give you weapons that he does not know of. And see, here's the thing. He has given us weapons that the enemy doesn't know of. He's given us the word of God. He's given us prayer. He's given us fasting. He's given us meditation. God has given us those gifts so that we can meditate on his word. We can, get, we can fast and pray. We can get on our knees and, and, and begin to pray for one another and begin to pray for our world and begin to pray for people that need to hear the gospel. See, the enemy doesn't understand those weapons because they're not carnal. They're spiritual. He doesn't understand those. See, God has given us a shield of salvation. He's held us up with his right hand. And he's been gentle with us when we fail. How many of you fail? I can raise my hand because I've failed multiple times. But God's been gentle with me even though I've failed him. Even though I've failed in many, many ways, he's been gentle with me and he's loved me. And listen, verse 36 says, he enlarged my path so that my foot would not slip. In another psalm, David writes this. He writes, God, you turned and you heard my cry and you pulled me out of a miry pit and you set my feet on a rock. You see, God pulls us out of shaking sand, out of miry clay. Of, he, he takes us out of things where, where, where we are stumbling and we're falling. He widens our path. It's kind of like, it's kind of, my driveway right now is horrible because it's uphill. And when it rains a lot, guess what happens? Well, you get big ruts in the driveway and the driveway washes out. And so you're driving your car up and you're going, you're riding around like this trying to get up your driveway. You think, I just need to get to my house. But I think of that in terms of when God says he's going to widen our path, he widens our path. He smooths it out. So when you're driving along, it's like, I'm driving in a Cadillac. I'm driving easy style. <laughs> God makes our way easy. When we serve him, when we follow him. You see, the point that David is making in just these few verses is that if we follow the statutes of God where we started, and we follow the law of God as we started, and we treat people the way that God wants us to treat people, and we do what we're supposed to do, then we, un and we have an understanding of who God is. So there's three things there, right? No one understand God's laws and His precepts, and understand the Word of God. Two, that we must... We must also know how to treat these people, how to be merciful, how to be shrewd, how to be blameless, how to be pure, how to live our life. And when we understand who God is, who God really is, and that His way is perfect, then guess what? Then He gives us strength. He gives us power. He anoints us to overcome the enemy. He makes our way smooth. First time I ever went deep sea fishing. Wow. I was with my son, two of my, my two oldest sons, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, and his son. And we're going to, in the ocean and we're hitting four-foot waves. Boom. Oh. Boom. I mean, you're going up and down. And you're, I mean, it's four feet. You're going four feet in the air, and then it's slamming your four feet down into the ocean. And so we're we're riding along, boom, boom. And I turned around, and it was me and 
Only, only me and one other of my sons were not hanging over the boat puking our guns out. Oh. Oh, they're all just losing it. Because, right? Because it's rough. And because it's, you can't, you can't, you can't steady yourself. And they were losing, they were losing their lunch and their breakfast and everything else. Oh, mercy. And there's a couple of us, we're sitting there laughing at them. But it got in my mind of the fact that, hey, you know, life is rough. The sea is rough. Our life is like an ocean when it has big waves on it. It's rough. It's up and down all the time. But God gives us the ability to stand in the middle of that up and down and not be sick and not be troubled and not have any worry or fear because he will make our way straight through it. Because it's like kind of like this last time. I just came back from vacation and my boys and I took a charter out on the reef along the Carolina shore <clears throat> with about 80 other people. We're all standing on this boat and we're fishing. And it was smooth sailing. Man, it was the nicest, easiest. Like, Man, this is so much better than the last time we went. Yeah. You know? This is so much better. It's just smooth sailing. But it, picture, the picture of mine is, you know, the devil wants to make your life all choppy and rough and make you think that life is horrible. But Jesus says, oh, if you just follow me, I'll make your way. I'll make your way right. I will, I will make a path for you. I'll make a way for you. Because my way is perfect. My way is perfect. And I can make, I can help you get through this. You see, this is, the end of this psalm, if you read the rest of this psalm, David talks about, and I'll encourage you to read this. When you leave here today, read the rest of this psalm. Because David says, you've given me the victory. You've given me the power to defeat my enemy. I've won. I've won. I'm, I've overcome my enemy. You've made them dust. They're under my feet. You've given me the power to overcome them. Why is he saying that? First, because David said, I followed your law with all my heart. Second, I treated people the way you wanted me to treat people. Third, I understand that you are God and that you are perfect and who you are. And if I don't follow you, if I don't follow you, then my way is going to be rough. And it's going to be hard. But if I follow you with all my heart, you're going to make my path right, just, and it's going to make my life a whole lot easier. Because Amen. I can follow your way because you're perfect. Stand with me this morning. The first thing that we have to do in response to Psalm 18 is understand that if we have not asked Jesus to be in our life, we can't do this. It's impossible. If we have not said, Jesus, forgive me for my sin, come into my life and be my Lord and be my Savior. We can't. We can't physically do this. It's impossible. So we have to come to the place where we say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, come into my life. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. The second thing we have to understand about this song is that unless we dedicate ourselves to following the Word of God, we can't do this. We can't do this unless the Word of God is the most important thing in our life. Now, it can't be important if we don't read it. Amen? It can't be important if we don't study it. Reading it is not the same as studying it. Studying means we read it, and we try to understand it. And we read something, and when we don't read it, we say, we ask someone to help us understand it. Like your pastor or someone that is more wise in the word than we are. And I still today, I'll be honest, there are times where I call my father, dad, I don't get this. And there are times where I call more other men that are more senior in the faith than me. The senior just means they've got a few years in the faith. It doesn't mean they're old men. It just means they're more senior in the faith. They've been saved longer than I have. They've studied the Word of God longer than I have. 
And so I'll ask them. But you see, we have to dedicate ourselves to that, right? We have to make the point to, I want to understand the Word of God. I want to. But then when we do that, God has promised He'll reveal His Son to us. Amen. And we will, He said, I will show you all the mysteries of heaven and earth. <laughs> He's promised to tell us that. But we have to dedicate ourselves to that. So bow your heads with me. We're doing that just to reverence God this morning. Bowing our heads, closing our eyes. We're doing that to reverence God this morning. And I'm just going to ask this morning if there's anyone here that hasn't given their heart to Jesus Christ. They haven't asked forgiveness for their sins. And they want to do that today. Just slip your hand up this morning. Just slip your hand up this morning. Now if there are those of you who are here and you said... I've given my heart to God, but I have not dedicated my life to Him the way that you've described this morning. I've not given Him that effort that He's due. And I want to give Him that effort. I want to put everything into Him. Just lift your hand this morning. Oh, there's several of you that are raising your hands. And I just want to give Him every effort this morning. Now, if there are those of you that are struggling today, you, you found yourself in a struggle and you're looking at your life and saying, I feel defeated, I feel downcast, I feel downtrodden, I feel like the enemy is always always breathing down my neck, I don't feel like I can ever make a headway, and I, I just need God to come to my defense today, and you want to call for him and hear him say, here I come to save the day, raise your hand today. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you that we can come into your house. God, I thank you that we can worship you God, that we can come to you and give our lives to you. God, today, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, I pray that they find you in their life. If there's anyone that has heard this message today, even, even if over, over the live feed, God, if they've heard this message and they do not know you as their Lord and Savior, if they have not made you first in their life, that today, at hearing this, that they would make you first in their life today. God, for those that are here today and those that may be listening, God, that need to dedicate, rededicate, repurpose their life to the Word of God and dedicating themselves to learning and understanding the Word. God, I pray, God, that you give them strength. God, that you give them desire. God, that you increase a hunger inside their spirit that they want more and more and more that as they read the Word of God, you begin to open their eyes. You begin to help them to see. You, to, you increase their hunger and desire for the Word of God, to know you and to know the Word. And God, for those that are here today and listening, God, if they're feeling like the world is crashing in around them and they, that they don't, they don't know how they're going to make it through the day or the week or they don't even know how they're going to make it and, and through situations in their life, God, that this morning, wherever they are, that they hear your voice say, Here I come to save the day. Here I come to save you and make you through this circumstance, to make it through this trial, to make it through this hard time. Here I come, the God of all gods, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, the master and creator of all the universe and all the earth. Here I come to save your day. God, I pray that they hear that this morning in their heart and their life. God, that you make them strong in their faith, that you make them strong in the Word, that you strengthen their arms and you strengthen their feet. God, that you give them power to make war against the enemy. God, that you put a hedge of protection around those people that are feeling like the darts of the enemy are piercing them to their soul. God, give them protection. Give them a shield. Be their buckler. Be their defense. Be the sword that fights the enemy. Be the shield that takes away the arrows and the darts and the spears of the enemy. God, I pray, pray, pray that you would protect them today and give them strength. God, that you would help them to be able to do what you've called them to do. God, to share the gospel with whoever needs to hear it, whenever they need to hear it. God, let this people that are here today not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ under, this, under salvation, but to share their faith willingly and openly with all who wants to hear it. 
Oh God, help them to have the strength to do that. Give them the ability to overcome doubts in their minds, fears, oh God, feelings of weakness. Help them to have the power and the authority to overcome those things and be the spirit, soul winning church that they've been called to be. I ask these things in your name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Has God ministered to you today? Yes. Amen. Have you, do you feel like you heard the word of God that you needed to hear today? Yes. All right. Good, because God brought me here for a reason. Right? I don't just come by just because Dad asked me to come by. Because <laughs> when I do that, I like him to be here. Right? Okay. God asked me here to a reason to minister to you today with this message. And to hear that it's confirmed by, by my own mother who is sharing the same passage of Scripture with someone today means that there's a reason why we're here together today. Amen. To hear this word at this hour and this time. So God is giving you this message. Now it's your choice, right? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? How are you going to take this word and apply it to your life? Amen? Amen. The next part is on you. And I pray that God will help you take this word and use it in your life. Amen? Amen. All hearts and minds clear? Amen. Ready to go? Ready to Amen. do what God asks us to do? Amen. Let me pray a prayer of blessing over you this, this, this morning, and then we're going to have some time to eat, right? right? Fellowship with one another. God, I pray that you bless everyone that's here today. God, that you protect them, you watch over them. You protect their minds and their hearts from the things of this world and from this enemy. God, protect them. God, that you prosper their hands. Everything that they put their hands to, God, that you would make prosper and make blessed and make work and make whole. God, wherever they put their foot, I pray that you grant them territory and dominion over the enemy. God, that you give them power and authority to defeat the enemy in this world. God, that you watch over each and every one of these people as they go their separate ways into their homes and into their jobs and into their into uh, wh wh wherever they go, wherever they shop, wherever they spend their time. God, that you protect them, you watch over them, and you give them opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone who needs to hear. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 God bless you. It's good to be here.